We are not always responsible for the things that happen to us in our life, right? There are things that we experience in our lives that are very difficult and we all will go through them, you know, but we are responsible for healing them. So we can break this world a better place because it's only through our pain that the world is where it is. So welcome to the podcast today. Very excited. We have Suman Sherry on with us. Welcome, Suman. Hi, how are you? Good. I'm excited to have you on. So Suman is recruiting expert, talent matchmaker, of and CEO, right, of Cherry Talent Group. So Absolutely. I think you're wearing a lot of titles, as most of us do as entrepreneurs. Yes, every every title. <laughs> you know, it's interesting from your side on a recruiting. I just think, you know, as we're talking about all the different hats we wear as entrepreneurs, um, I think from your side, it'd be really interesting because you're running a business, right? You're marketing, you know, uh, cash flow, um, all these different things you have like we have, but you're also managing, you're working with different companies, different industries, you know, different candidates. Um, maybe, you know, just a snapshot from the organization, organizational side, how do you find time to manage just all these different elements pulling at you from just, you know, the, what, what your business and you're focused on and, and trying to comply with, um, you know, those that are applying and, you know, the candidates that, that you're overseeing? So it's a lot of time management, right? I have to do, I mean, I'm also a mom. I'm also a wife. I have a lot of other so. things, right? <laughs> so I, I do have a really amazing assistant that works with me and she helps me with so many pieces. And I really try to, for me, I really try to streamline the process for myself. So I know what my strengths are, right? I know what I'm really good at. And then the parts that I need help with, I have no problem help getting help on the marketing, the branding, those pieces. Um, and also it's all about, I learned this a long time ago in recruiting. It's, you have to really understand where you kind of are in the process. So when I have candidates that are actively interviewing and they're um, negotiating contracts and those pieces, those are my priorities, right? And then I'm gonna kind of stream backwards from there. Because for me, it's like, where's the closest relationship piece What's the closest to the human connection piece and how do I work around that? So some of these pieces I've, I've realized like being an entrepreneur, being an, you know, an owner of a company, a lot of times we get boggled down by to trying to do everything and we don't want to go out and ask for help. But I really do. I really have learned that the best way to handle it is to grow before you're ready, to invest in the people and the resources you need before you're really ready to do it, because that's how growth happens. So I don't know. It, it's interesting. I, I want to come back to the human connection. I think that's a really key phrase, right, that you mentioned. But what's interesting is, you know, when you speak about your strengths, that you know what those are and those where you're going to focus on. H how long into your career was that the case? Because I think most of us struggle to understand, you, you know, especially as an entrepreneur, you're wearing these different hats. You're trying to be involved. You're trying not to micromanage. But the reality is we're not good at everything. And there's certain things we're really good at as business owners. Um, maybe there's a little bit of pride and ego we have to put to the side, but when you say invest in others for your growth, you know, there's a leap of faith there. Uh, there has to be structure in place. How has that evolved over your career from the very beginning to realize, Hey, I'm, this isn't my strong suit. So I'm going to hire someone. I'm going to get, you know, have them focus on this. Why focus on this? You know, I, I, how has that transition worked for you over time in your career? So for me, it came from failure, honestly. Um, <laughs> I <laughs> I had a very, very, very successful recruiting, more contingent based, because right now I'm doing more consulting based recruiting. I had a very successful recruiting agency about 10 years ago, and it got very fast, really big, quickly. And um, I really didn't ask for a lot of help. I tried to do everything myself. I burned myself out. I was stressed out. I brought that stress in my family. I had, I think my daughter at the time was like a newborn and my husband, it was a very difficult time. And you're right. The ego piece played into it because my husband would try to help with that piece or like he was making suggestions like, Hey, we, we need some help. And I was like, no. And like, I know I was going to do it my way. And I had this kind of belief that I had to do everything like this control piece. Like if I didn't do it, the, do it, it wasn't going to get done. So then it failed. <laughs> Honestly, the whole thing just kind of collapsed under me from, cause we create our own realities. We do. And so all that stress, all of the place of being so having all this success, but being unhappy in it, 
in the end, it all burned to the ground and it was the best thing for me in my life because then it reconnected my connection. And honestly, my connection to, for me, it's God or universe or however you say, but that's like the first place of my life, right? Like I live from that place. So in that space, I understand that I'm a human and I need to um, invest in other people, believe in other people, trust in other people and understand that I create this. So having that ability to be able to ask for help and to spend the money and do the resources. And that has happened in my own personal life as well. Like I went out and did coaching and healed and did the trauma work and did all the mindset work and spent five years doing that, invested, you know, to $60,000 in my own personal growth. But that's reflected back in what I've created now with Cherry Talent Group. It's interesting you bring that up because I, at the core of it, all of us have our why, right? You know, faith, family. I mean, there's uh, some sort of structure or valuation that we have, and that's what drives many of us. But, you know, to your point with burnout, as you were sharing that, it made there's there's a really good, you know, friend of mine, colleague, mentor, um, someone who's been really successful and construction related, like has his own construction company and, you know, has had a lot of growth, but has not hired. And by lack of hiring, this person is burnt out. Like, I think you said it perfectly where they're just like, it's just bleeding everywhere, right? Through all these different aspects of the company. They're just not happy and making great money, making a great living, but there's no happiness anywhere around. And, you know, a lot of us have to come back and I'm sure maybe you could speak to just some of the coaching and healing process you had that sometimes through failure, you recognize that, hey, am I putting the valuation, as you mentioned, you know, that structure, whether it be faith or money or God or what, you know, family, whatever, is it in the wrong bucket, right? Because if it is, well, now I'm losing everywhere. I'm not really happy and I'm not really inspired to do what I need to do. And, you know, how did that reevaluation, you know, just hitting rock bottom, coming back up, how has that kind of changed your foresight now into the business you've created? So I think for me, it's like I, you know, when I, I took a break from recruiting, um, you know, I, I stayed in recruiting for a while, and but I wasn't really into it, right? My heart was never really present there. I just was doing it from this place of I need to make money, I need to provide for my family, but I didn't feel good into it. So when I started my healing journey, I took actually just took disconnected from the entire recruiting space. And I was like, I don't think I want to recruit anymore. I think I'm done with this. I think I want to do something else. And when I did that, and I kind of really surrendered into understanding all my failures, there really weren't failures, they were just opportunities for me to connect closer to my own faith. And I evaluate things now for my company that my faith and my connection to myself is my number one place, my family's number two, and the success and all those pieces just come from like that. I have to have that grounded place, if that makes sense. Like it has to grow from my values within myself and those values I brought into my own, this business as well, like very transparent, authentic based, highly communicative. Um, and also when you're talking to people, when you're talking to candidates and clients, you have to remember this is a human connection. These are humans. These are, these are people that have been through things. And it's more than just a resume, right? A resume is a piece of paper, but you need to understand who they are, why they made the choices they made on the resume. And that's an opportunity to see someone from a different light and have a compassion place. And so when you're relaying that information back to your, to your client, um, you're knowing who they are. Like we just recently like, you know, placed someone who had gone through a very difficult divorce. Right. So he was in a different place right now. And that was something that we needed to evaluate. Right. And have that conversation. So you have, I don't know if that makes sense. Like bringing this kind of human piece to recruiting because it should be that way because it's not like because most a lot of times recruiters will make candidates feel like robots like they're ro very robotic and it's because it is very transactional there's a transactional element to traditional recruiting is very contingent based so it's we pay you a percentage of once you make this placement on this candidate there's no upfront cost or anything but there is a transaction that happens and so there's a lot of attachment to specific candidates because that's how they only make their own money through that way. So it has a different feel. I'm not saying it's negative, but when I started doing 
my business from this consulting place where it was more coaching based, where it was more interactive. It was more communication based. It Now I love it. Now I love it. You know, it's interesting you say that because I, Empathy uh, is definitely something lost in, in culture these days. Uh, you know, I think me, th- there's a lot of things that even I try to be empathetic at times. You know, I struggle with that. Um, uh, it's just probably one of my human weaknesses to be open. Um, but compassion is important. I think the human element is really interesting, assuming because as you're thinking about candidates, I can only imagine from your perspective, you're going to have a, a, a wide variety. And what I mean by that is I'm, I'm sure a lot of candidates are coming in. And they may be in a position of life where they're looking to advance their career or maybe a new opportunity. It may, you know, although there's like a, a, a talent from their side, it's maybe not a, a, a priority to some extent, but it's, you know, it's different as you mentioned, someone who's divorced, there could be someone dealing with a life-changing experience. Maybe they're laid off uh, family, you know, maybe they have family and, and, you know, mouths at home they have to feed. I would imagine that there are some people that are coming in a little bit more dire circumstance, looking to get a position how does that affect you? Because as you're trying to have compassion and empathy and get them in the right place, it's one thing just to do the transaction. It's another thing to put them in the right place, right culture where they can be successful and now have the livelihood that they need to make and earn a good living and support themselves. I mean, when I when we evaluate candidates, the first place we start was always going to be the hard skills, right? There are certain requirements that are going to be needed in certain positions, right? Some of them are coachable, but you know, when you're talking about engineering roles or very specific roles, I do a lot of recruiting and construction. So we do a lot of recruitment with superintendents, project managers, estimators, construction managers, foremen. Those are those are pretty specific. I mean, you would have to have experience some level of experience in most likely the construction industry to understand how construction is run, especially on some of these larger commercial jobs and things, there was there, there needs to be that technical element. Now, but there also is a soft skill piece, right, as well. So when you're evaluating, when we do evaluations with people, we're asking about who they are. We're wanting to find out what their situations are. And we evaluate that as well. Um, I try not to be biased. So if we have a really good candidate that has a personal situation. They share that situation with us and they also have the hard skills, but they, they also aligned in their kind of values based on the conversations we had. I will present that to the, to the client. Now, again, it's up to the client. If that is something they want to move forward to just interview. And in most cases they will. Um, It's the same piece with if somebody, they have a certain, a very specific salary range, but it's a little bit low, and we find a really exceptional candidate that maybe is a little more, we're going to go ahead and present them as well. Because our job, what we want to do at Cherry Talent Group, is be like a huge net, and we're bringing in different options. Because a lot of times when clients or candidates, or clients come to us with a position, they have this very kind of, like, it has to be this, right? And so, but this, there's like two of them. So <laughs> let's let's talk about what we really need. Like what's the next level below? What are we looking at here? And so that's a lot of the communication that happens on the client side. And so a lot of times what ends up happening is we do bring in different types of people who have different types of backgrounds and maybe don't have exactly the right match, but they're so their personalities and they're hungry and they're motivated and they they bring like a positive energy and experience to the company and and the client can feel that right away and they'll take a chance on someone. Right. So I've seen the soft skills play out so much more like stronger. Most clients think they want this, like they give us this huge agenda of like a hundred things on this hard skill piece. But when you really talk to them, you're like, but what if they're not nice? Like what if they're jerks? What if they're negative? What if they're toxic? What if they, would you still want them? You know, Um, what if they can, like we evaluate, like when they're asking about past positions, if they're talking about terribly about all their past jobs and every it's always been someone else's fault, we'll ask them, well, what was your responsibility in that? And if they can't take responsibility for their place, because it obviously everything is a two-way place, then that's something that we need to evaluate, if that makes sense. Yeah, that's really interesting. It's funny when you were speaking about the analogy of uh, th- th- there's a wish list per se. You think of uh, like house hunter, you know, everyone or first time home buyer, they come <laughs> in and they're like, <laughs> you know, I want you know, this huge, you know, master suite and outdoor living space and all these things, but here's my budget. And you're like, well, the reality is there's nothing that really lines up. You know, you have to be a little realistic. Um, but, you know, the culture side is interesting because um, 
you know, from a experience standpoint, there's no doubt, you know, medical construction engineering, there has to be some level of sophistication, understanding, comprehension of, of the, of the job duty, job description and what they're going to be perform, performing. Um, but, but at the core of it, company culture is so huge because as they come in and it's a really strong company culture, um, you know, having someone that aligns with that culture is going to be way more important than someone with a ton of core skills. Because if you have a bad apple in the group, and I learned this actually early on when I started the podcast, is that it doesn't matter how talented someone is. Jeremy uh, Andrews, who's the CEO of Traeger, I mean, he talked about this when he was purchasing Traeger, the smokers, and he's like, you know, it, it doesn't matter how talented the person is or how knowledgeable, if they are a cancer to the company culture, you have to let them go. It, it ruins everything. So that human element, as you continue, you know, the human connection, uh, I can imagine that's a huge part as you're vetting the, the client, as you're vetting, you know, the candidate you're representing. Um, how do you massage that relationship to really know to the best of your ability? I know there's certain limits that you're putting them in a position where it's a good culture and they can be successful. I think it really begins with the client side to start with, right? So when we do the initial profile, we're pretty selective. I mean, we're not, we, we look, we're, we're growing. So we want to take on and try new things. But when we're having those conversations with our client up front, well, there are specific um, pieces that make this model work. And they're specific. So we've had clients where it didn't work. And the reason it didn't work was because there was a breakdown in communication. Um, we if we submit a resume over, we expect feedback that day or the day after, unless someone's out of town or something, we do not ghost and we are not okay with ghosting. We are not okay with not giving feedback on candidates. We also need to have direct communication with the hiring managers. Like we need to be able to text them a quick question. Hey, I came across this candidate, blah, 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 blah. So we can evaluate it pretty quickly um, in that first position that we work on with how how communication, I mean, how um, open are they to receiving communication or feedback back and forth? How um, strong are they at, you know, taking, I don't want to say criticism, but like, we are very honest, right? So like, we're like, I know you want this, but you know, that doesn't, and I've had to have that conversation, like on a position, like, hey, we've been working on this position for X amount of time, you guys have spent this much money. And if we're not willing to change the parameters of the search, I don't think we can fill it. Because to me, it's like a more beneficial thing. Um, on the other side is we're very direct with our, we get a really good understanding of who our client is as well. So we are very direct with our candidates as well. Like we don't sugarcoat things. We're like, this is what the CEO's personality is like. This is what who you're going to be working with. This is the values of the company. They expect 50 hours a week. That is what it is. And if you're not, if that's not something you're in comfortable working, that's probably not going to be the right match for you. We are not trying to force someone into a job or convince someone into a job. We are presenting information and we're letting them have an evaluation if it's a good match for them. So I don't know if that kind of answers the question. So for us, it's like it's like anything else. It's like it is matchmaking, right? We're just trying to find out that piece. And sometimes it happens. You know, we have a position and we have six, seven candidates. I just recently had a position where we had six people interview. It just didn't work out. We kind of put the position on hold. He's like, okay, we'll take a break. Then I work in another position and the perfect candidate just shows up. Like, and I'm like, hey, I got a candidate for you kind of thing. And then that's, it's done. So it happens, you know? And so the clients we work with are really just awesome clients too. They're all very growth oriented. They're all very um, people centric. They care. They care about their people. I, in my opinion, you answered the question. The reason being because something I never thought about, but it makes complete sense. As you mentioned that, you know, if a company is looking for growth, they're looking for a position, they're looking for talent. And they're reaching out to you. This is a position they're trying to, to, to um, you know, to fill. And if they're not communicating with you, if they're not being responsive to the resume and all the information that you are now coming to your full arsenal, and you're holding them accountable, and I can imagine from just interactions of how they're treating a potential hire, because this is honeymoon stage, right? I mean, any of us that were recruited out of college or work for a company, you know, it's just like. Pie, you know, pie in the sky, this amazing opportunity. And then the reality is it's hard work like any business. Right. But if it's not good at the honeymoon stage or the dating stage, how's it going to be at the marriage stage, right? And so those are those little nuances that go into um, the hiring aspect, which I can only imagine that quickly you're going to get a full, 
you know, understanding of the people behind the scenes that are even making the hiring. And that's going to affect HR and everything else, you know, company wide. Yeah, absolutely. And the other piece is that we, we do do some coaching with our clients as well on the interviewing side. Um, if they want some coaching, we can help them. So sort of tap into trying to get a better gauge of just the typical questions, just to get an idea of, so, of, of, of who someone is um, from a personal level, because, you know, our values as a person, they carry over into all aspects of our life. So it's really, I think it's just really important to know your people and to understand like, who are they? Like, what, what kind of hobbies do you have? What do you enjoy doing? You know, what did you do as a kid? These are questions that we ask our candidates because we want to know, right? Tell me a little bit about, um, what you enjoyed most of your job, you know, more than just that, tell me about your weakness and tell me about your, I mean, those are, you know, yeah. but what it, it's a conversation. It's, it's like, it's dating. It really is dating. Like, tell me about yourself. Tell me about what you want, what you're, what you enjoy. And then to see if that sort of fits in. And, and I think that's very true about what you said about the um, it's a job, right? It's like anything else. It's has its good places. I mean, there's always, it's a job and everything in life or life itself, kids, relationships. I mean, it's just, you have, Sometimes you have a struggle. It's how it works. It's the same thing with job. It's not going to always be easy, especially when you're starting off. And that's another thing. We were very, very like honest with our candidates. Like this is a fast environment. You're estimating X, 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 X. You're doing this, this, this. Is And then sometimes candidates will say, no, that's not what I'm looking for. That's great. We're not there. This isn't the right match for you. But we really try to be very direct and honest with our candidates. So it's interesting. You mentioned, especially from the dating aspect, just understanding, you know, attributes, you know, what they do for fun and a little bit about the person. What, what's your opinion? I know some of these bigger companies are really big on personality tests, right? And doing these comprehensive exams, you come in and then they kind of get a feel if you're going to hurt, hit a certain benchmark or kind of fit. Um, any experience with those? Do you use those from a recruitment side? Um, you know, how does that play with some of the companies you're working with? I've had, I've had several companies I've worked with that have used them. And I kind of feel the way about them as I feel about like the AI stuff, right? I think there is some benefit to it. I think there is some like gives you better insight. But I also think, again, this is a human being. Like where was he or she in that moment when she took that test? Was she nervous? Has she not interviewed in 20 years? I mean, it's like... And then, and some people are like, so I'm like an extroverted personality. So I take those personalities. I love it. Right. My husband's an introvert. He takes those personalities. Like, I don't know. I don't know what they do. <laughs> you know? So like some people just don't do well in those types of things. So it's like very difficult to gauge. I think it's nice for insight. You know, like I remember when I was starting off in recruiting, we did this, like the Meyer, I think it's the Meyer. I don't remember which one it was. It was a color one. And it was like, you're a blue or red and, you're a green and a whatever. And that was, I thought that was really beneficial. I think it's really nice for companies to do that in an organization to kind of understand themselves and their style of management and what this person needs from their leader because everyone's different. But again, I think it's skewed in a way. So. Yeah, it is. And, and so going back to that, when you look at candidates, you know, if someone's looking to be a strong candidate for you, right. As, as a candidate for a potential job hire, what are you seeing for people to either prepare in their profession, you know, direction they want to go? What what makes a good candidate? Well, I mean, obviously the first place we look is the resume, right? Your resume is your is your business card. So you need to put energy into your resume. I, I see it all the time where I see a, a very strong candidate and I call them up and I say, Well, your resume hasn't been updated since 2020. Oh yeah, I haven't had a chance to update it. I'm mm-hmm. like, And I will call them because, you know, I see past it. Right. I'm like, let's I'm curious. I'm like a little curious kitty. I don't want to see what's going in there. But I say, you know, and I'm real honest with the candidates. You need to update this because other recruiters, they're not like me. And they're just whizzing through your resume and think you haven't worked in three years. The other thing I see that needs to be on the resumes is people are, again, the hard skills, like the list they spend maybe 30 minutes or copy and paste a job description and throw it in there or something like that. No. What did you bring value wise to a company? 
what did you bring to that company? Because you did. You need to brag about yourself a little bit. Like what, if you're a sales manager, what, show me, show the numbers. What was the production like? What did you, if you're an office manager, what did you do as far as processes and programs you brought in that made it more efficient, the process itself? That's what needs to be on there. Cause that's what companies want to see. Like ultimately what companies are trying to see is, okay, I, I have this company um, and I have this mission and I have this purpose and I want to grow it to this place. And I need these people to help me do that. And can this person do that? I, I, I love the value proposition, I think, uh, in any aspect of life, right? Me as a business owner, uh, my success, you know, again, if you, for me, sell a job, you know, not the cheapest, not the most expensive. What's the value proposition that I'm bringing to my client? That's going to, that's going to be, you know, the deal closer, right? Is that value. That's why people are hired. That's why businesses are successful and companies are successful. Same as employees. It's interesting that you, you position it that way, because it's one thing to just robotically put down a job description. But if you're actually showing, Hey, this is how the company performed. I, you know, I come in, here's how it performs now. Here's, you know, here's how we grew a good example of mine. There's a friend of mine, Justin Newman and, and the company, he, he came in as the president and he started self-performing divisions. And now this company is completely expanded in all these different markets and, um, you know, different financial, you know, resources because of what he's grown. And so, Essentially, that's what you're speaking about, right? Suman is that they can come in and they can put these, you know, value propositions and that enhances. With that being said, today, 2023, uh, importance of a resume, cover letter. How has that changed with hiring? Are you seeing any changes to that or is it still a huge staple of candidates? Um, resume, yes. I mean, resumes are very important. They will always be important. Unless you know someone, I guess, directly, but yes. Resumes, that needs to be... You need, and if you need help, you need to go hire a resume writer and invest the whatever amount of money, $500 and go get one. Um, you need to put a lot of energy in that. Cover letters, I don't really see cover letters anymore. I think, I, I know some companies require them when they apply online. We don't require them. Now, if we're working with a project manager or superintendent, uh, we need project lists. Like we need to have like what their project lists are, their current projects they've worked on, what types of projects they were those types of things. So we're evaluating that piece. But the resume piece is really important because they say on average when a recruiter's, like when a recruiter's looking at your resume, and that might be a contingent recruiter or me or an in-house recruiter, they spend 10 seconds looking at a resume or 15 seconds. So it's short. It really is like dating. It's like that same, like, I mean, it's like, it is because you have to be able to catch. And like what you said was so true. Like, what can you show value-wise that you can bring to the organization that you've learned? Like, oh, wow, this person implemented this system. We were thinking about implementing a similar system. That would be something they could help us with, right? Or something like that. And that's yeah, where really the starting place be. It's always going to be, it is always going to be a resume, your LinkedIn profile. Your LinkedIn profile needs to be clean. You need to spend the time on it. You need to highlight yourself. I, I see a lot of times um, with candidates, it's very interesting. I think humbleness is amazing. I, I mean, absolutely. You know, we don't ever want to be running with our ego and in, in charge, right? Like this two-year-old in charge. But the ego plays a place, right? It's our personality. It has it. It helps us. And why not be proud of the things that we've accomplished? LinkedIn should be used for that. You should use that as a very strong place to share your thoughts on industry pieces or things you're reading about um, and also making sure your resume or your information is always updated in there and a professional picture. Another thing you need to have a professional picture. Um, but things like that are really interesting. And then, you know, obviously social media, like this has happened, you know, where we've had a candidate who was a great candidate and we did some social media. <laughs> I mean, I mean, and not that somebody's political beliefs or whatever beliefs, but if you are out there arguing with people and fighting with people or whatever you're, it's going to, I mean, that's a problem. So it, it's just like people need to take responsibility. Like everyone does this personal responsibility well, piece. It, it's interesting to bring up the social media. Cause I think any business owner was, we looked at hiring all of us. We can do a little research, right. On, on who the candidate is as much as we can find. And again, it's not to, uh, um, 
uh, it's more to your point that anytime we're hiring someone, there's risk involved, right? There's cost involved for me to hire someone and train them and put in, you know, equipment and, and support and, you know, time. And, you know, there's so many things. Anyone knows that you've had bad hires that cost you a lot of money. It's a lot easier to retain good people. Um, and so if you have someone that could um, uh, be a wild card, you know, how's that going to jeopardize your brand and, and, and company? I think LinkedIn's really interesting. You know, the confidence aspect you mentioned, um, most of us understand. Uh, I know for me today as a business owner, as opposed to when I started my company 11 years ago, I'm a lot more confident in what it takes to run a business. I'm a lot more confident in the costs involved. Case in point, I was interviewing for a project yesterday and, you know, I was, the, there was a, a team interviewing. So it's not just the client, but there were other team members involved, consultants and stuff. And, you know, really direct on some certain aspects to the build process that they were leaning on me or my company to kind of see my response. And to your point, I've made enough failures in my years, you know, that I'm like, well, I've made that mistake, so I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to allow that in the contract. I'm not going to allow this negotiation. And so I could confidently stand there and just say, hey, here's my position. This is why uh, I could communicate that properly because I've made those mistakes. And so at the end of it, they're like, well, that makes sense. We're good with that. Absolutely. You know, and and so, but what's interesting is even if you don't have maybe the time in front of that potential company that you're working for, you can build that confidence. You can build that um, database, if you will, as you mentioned, through LinkedIn and other social media platforms where you can show just the experience you had. And essentially, that's what you're speaking to by having a good headshot and, and good yeah. backup to what you're presenting. Right. Because, you know, it's a lot easier to find a job when you already have a job. Yeah. Better to. <laughs> that's true. I mean, the thing is, the truth is, is like we're not, I mean, the days of my dad, like, you know, when I was with Exxon Mobil for 40 years, right? That's just not what it used to be. Now he's got, you know, he's got the retirement, the pension, and the, and and maybe there is some companies like that, but most people leave within, you know, five to seven years seems to be the four to seven years seems to be the sweet spot, right? Especially with a little, I want a, a little bit younger than my age range, you know. Um, it's it's a marketing tool, right? It's a branding tool. It's a free branding tool, and 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 why not, like. I think it's really important to see your worth as well, because, you know, we learn so much, like we learn so much in life. We learn so much in our, in our careers and those types of things. And those things need to be emphasized, especially from a career standpoint, because you don't know who's out there and you don't know what opportunities could be out there potentially. Maybe something you didn't even think about could be the next level for you. And I think that, and I think that's a really important piece. Like instead of, I think a lot of us live and this scarcity mindset where we only do things when we're in survival. It's like, oh, I have to do this. Like, I have to lose weight because I, the doctor says I'm going to have a heart attack, you know, or I'm having health problems or whatever it is, you know, I have to, I have to do these things. But if you can start being a more proactive and this, I mean, more abundant mindset where there's unlimited opportunities, who knows what that potentially could lead to that gives you more opportunity. And I, and I, and I, I absolutely believe you should spend your time on your resume. You should spend your time on your LinkedIn page. You should spend your time on seeing what's in your industry and what's interesting and sharing that stuff. Yeah, absolutely. That's really good information. What's interesting from the, the, the practical side of, you know, resumes, you're mentioning the importance and showing value and you have, um, you know, LinkedIn and we have other resources, right. That we can show our worth. What about, um, traits. I think that's really hard to show your traits. You know, what, what traits does a good candidate have, uh, you know, in your experience working with so many different candidates I, and how do they showcase those? I mean, I think, I think the same traits that are <laughs> positive for a human in general, um, integrity, you know, um, consistent, um, what else? Uh, transparent, authentic, um, positive mindset. I think that's a very important piece. Growth, positive mindset. Um, somebody who falls down and, and can get back up takes res radical responsibility. I think that is probably number one of a very good candidate. So what we do is, you know, we ask, we ask the questions, well, okay, why, why did you leave? And they'll give you something. No, no. I want to know why you really left. Tell me. And then they'll tell you and you're like, okay, so what really happened? 
And then they tell you, and then you're, and that's kind of how, you know, when you're questioning them, how honest are they? How transparent are they? How real are they? How good are they at communicating back with you? Like if you say to them, Hey, okay, I'm going to need you to send my res. And I do this with candidates. I say, okay, so I have your res. I need to get a clean copy of your resume. I need this resume by, can you get to me by 10 a.m. tomorrow morning? Yeah. Okay. I set that expectation, right? I think it's very important to set these expectations. And communication and follow-up. And, um, and honestly, they're just nice, you know? Like, they're easy to talk to. They're very friendly. They take crit. I mean, another thing is we we coach. Like, we'll say, don't say that. Like, <laughs> And then I'll say, okay. And I'll ask her, can I get, and I'll ask her permission. Is it okay if I give you a little advice? Yeah, yeah, give me advice. <laughs> okay. And if they get defensive, you know, that's one place. And if if they're rude, if like if my assistant calls me and says, that candidate was rude, I'm like, no, nope. no. Nope. Because if they're rude well, to us and they're not, yeah. like it's a problem, right? Well, if they're rude to you, who's essentially their liaison, like yeah. you're their matchmaker as we yeah. mentioned yeah. uh that that that's a big problem you know that you're like whoa red flags you know i'm not referring to anybody yeah. um the attorney client privilege is interesting because you mentioned that you know there is uh, you know privacy or the reality is something happened right why, why they're leaving the last position it could be self-inflicted it could be company culture it could be you know a lot of variations you know time constraints you right. know demand whatever it is um but the timelines you put on when i'm thinking about how you're vetting you know your incredible candidates it makes sense that when you're giving them to-do lists and duties and timelines and make them accountable and following up, you're going to quickly know, you know, the caliber of talent that you're essentially representing because that's an arm of you and your company and your brand on yeah. who you're bringing into, you know, the position. Yeah. And, you know, and we are going through hundreds of resumes and we might only submit, you know, I don't, I know what I did because I did contingent recruiting for most of my career. So I know when I was a contingent recruiter, we would submit a lot of resumes and it, and hope they would stick on the, you know, I mean, it's just what it is. We would, some good candidates, but we would kind of throw things, you know, but that's not how it is with us. We're spending, we, when we talk to a candidate um, that we're, first we source hundreds of resumes before we even pick up the phone. Then we have the initial phone call that might take 45 minutes. Then if, if it's a, if it's a higher end position, my assistant, I call them as well. I'm having another 45 minute to an hour conversation with them. So the process itself is um, very, we're, we're really building that relationship, right? Like we, that relationship piece is so built, like we're calling them before the interview. We're checking in and after the interview. We're checking in with a couple of days, you know, we're checking with them just like our clients. So we almost, we start building that trust and that relationship with them pretty quickly. And when people feel that relationship with you and you feel like they're, they're trying to help me, they're not you know, I'm not just a number, they're a lot more open to share things that are going on as well. You know what I mean? If that makes sense. Oh, absolutely. It does. Let, let me ask you this because I don't want you, of course, to give away the financial side of your business, but from a recruiting aspect, what, what does that fee structure look like essentially, um, you know, for anyone that's saying, you know, assuming I want to hire you, yeah. um, you know, to give me some candidates. So are you, the candidates, are you charging them or is it always the employer? You know, how does that structure work? So we, at this point, we are only working from the client perspective. So we charge by the hour. Um, and, and I, I know up front, our range is 75 to an hundred dollars an hour. It's, that's what it is. So we charge anywhere between 75 to a hundred dollars an hour, depending on the type of position. And we also help them the job description. So on the client side, like what can a client do to be better? Your job descriptions are terrible. Like it, it I mean, I get job descriptions. They're like, oh, I, I we're using this job description. It's like 10 pages. Like I'm like, no, like we go in, we dissect that whole job description. We are branding them. We are creating that buzz about them. You know, we're, we're going, we're going on their website. We're rewriting this entire thing. Then we're getting approval from them. We're collaborating with them. We're asking them, is this what it is? We're looking at other job descriptions in the area as compared. And so that we can make sure that all, you know, it, it looks good. So um, I completely lost my question. Oh, that's how. So that's how it works. We, and we want to streamline the process. Like we're very flexible as far as um, 
you know, we understand it happens. Like you end up filling the position internally. Okay, we'll just give you, send you the hours that we worked, right? Or you, um, it didn't work out or you say, you know, we're putting this position on hold. Okay. You know, it's a very flexible type of model. You say, you know, it's not a huge priority for us, but could you maybe put in 10 hours a week, 15 hours a week? Sure. You know what I mean? So it's not, that's, it's a very clean way of seeing it. We are also communicating with you all the time. We are um, putting it on social media. You know, obviously we're using the deeds, the LinkedIn, the ZipRecruiter, all mm-hmm. those pieces. So we charge an additional, like, I don't know what the number is, but under $500 marketing fee as well for each position. Um, Cause we really know those systems as well, because if you don't know those systems, you can be charged thousands and thousands of dollars. If you don't pay attention to like, indeed, I had a client who brought us on and he said, I had this position up for like a week and a half. I got charged a thousand dollars. What happened? Here? And I'm like, yeah. When I worked in the position, he got charged 150. So we just know the system. So, so you get a lot with us. We are giving you um, our time. We're giving our expertise. We're really direct. We're giving you good candidates. And then we talk about the candidates. And, and I think at this model too, because it's, it is hourly based. So our clients really use this as a consultant after the interview. So here's what I liked about him. What do you think about this? What was, when you interviewed him, what did you think? And then we kind of compare notes, right? Um, and on the candidate side, well, I like this, but did it, the negotiation, the salary, right? That always ends up being a thing. We help negotiate the salary, but we don't have any attachment to the salary. So we're just trying to make sure that it fits for both of them, if that makes sense. So we can pretty much nope. handle all of it. <laughs> Yeah. And the sellers, that makes sense because, and you spoke to this a little bit just a minute ago, is that when you're looking at the job description and website, I mean, you're making sure that it's, you know, you're comparing other positions in the area, in the market, what other people are paying. So I'm sure you have a good pulse on what that should be so that you can kind of be that liaison between the two. Um, And and you touched on a little bit, but benefit of hiring, you know, recruiting firms such as yourself, as opposed to just going on Indeed or LinkedIn and putting out a general inquiry. Yeah. I mean, there's the cost and there's more of the time. I mean, if you're a, you know, you're, you know, you're, I mean, do you have time to go through 300 resumes? No, no. You have time to call and, yeah. and, and schedule interviews and then unschedule the interview and then reschedule the interview. And when they're on the way to the interview and they're like, I'm lost, where do I go? I mean, that's what we're doing at 630 in the morning for candidates. You know what I mean? There's just a very concierge service or your clients like, I can't find their number. It's somewhere. Can you send it to, you know, we're like, we're, we're like, you're everything. Like we're there like to help you with the whole process and all pieces of it, you know, or a situation. I mean, there's so many situations that happen in hiring. I mean, you're dealing with two people, you know, it's not a product. It's two human beings. Yeah. That's, that's really interesting. Um, from from your side, do you ever have, you know, when you, as you think about business development, sales, marketing, um, you know, for, for example, me, I have to continue to, you know, look down the pipeline, look at our backlog, you know, look at with confidence where the projects are, you know, our hiring, where we're at. And so I'm always trying to feed the machine, right? Feed that pipeline and making sure that we always have that runway for our team. How does that look like for you? Because I would imagine it could fluctuate, you know, to create a healthy backlog of candidates and positions. You know, I'm sure it goes up and down. How are you continuing to market to, you know, brand reach and representation that as, as you've grown your company? So for us, we a lot of our business comes from referrals just up front. I mean, we we work a lot in the construction industry. It's a it's a it is a big industry, but it's everyone works together. Right. So we do so much work in that industry. So most of our most of our business has been up until this point has been very referral based. Um, we've also done some social media. We are launching like lead generation for LinkedIn now. We're also I'm also going to start doing webinars um, about topics, uh, different staffing, you know, recruiting topics. We're also going to um, we want to we want to be of service as well, right? Where it's not just you know, obviously we're a business. We want to make money and those types of things. But for us, it's a bigger piece. Like we want to, I want to change how this is done. Like I don't like the way recruiting is done. I don't like the fact people get ghosted. I don't like the fact that people get burned out at their jobs and um, because they can't hire the right people or 
and I see it, my husband has his own business. It's hard. Like when you're a business owner and you can't find those people and you're having to do all those things and you don't have the right people or you're scared to let someone go because if they, because if you let them go, then the whole thing falls apart and you can't find the right talent. So it's a bigger thing for me. Um, lead generation, obviously I do the podcast piece, um, the webinars I'll start rolling out, word of mouth. We're going to start um, rolling out a candidate side as well. That's our new kind of piece, doing some candidate, helping candidates on the coaching piece. Um, that's something that we're going to be creating the next few months. We also have just rolled out a referral program. And it's been nice. Like we let our clients, candidates know, hey, if you know, because they know, you know, they're working, they're in or talking to candidate, you know, different companies all the time. And we, that's the thing. We try to teach, treat everyone really well. So they want to work with us again. And also because we want to treat them well. So I don't know if, if that's the way to do it, but that's how we're doing it. Well, again, it goes back to the value. I mean, we've been speaking about value a lot throughout this conversation. And, you know, as a business owner, entrepreneur, the reality is, look, you only have so much time in the day, assuming and, and as well as I do. And so, yeah. Can you pick one social media platform? Can you say just the podcast? Can you say just word of mouth, uh, you know, the, the design network, whatever it is, these are all elements. And ideally you'd be hitting all those areas. Right. Um, but you can hit some of them, but at the end of the day, if you're providing value to the industry, value to your network, putting out information and webinars and content on LinkedIn and these other things where people are learning, um, essentially you're educating your clientele, you're educating those that are hiring your services and slowly, but surely you're changing the industry. And ideally that's kind of your goal. Yeah, that is the goal. I really, I really want to change how the industry's done. I mean, there's just not a very good option, right? You've got two right now. There's only really two options in recruiting. You can hire in house. You can bring in an HR group with internal recruiters. Um, and I'm not saying anything negative or positive, but they HR people have a lot of responsibilities outside of recruiting, right? They wear a lot of hats. So they're dealing with major things going on in the organization, trying to make sure the people that are working there are staying happy. On the internal recruitment side, um, you can bring in internal recruiters, but they work on, you know, they might be in order to be able to afford an internal recruiter for a company, they have to justify that. So because, you know, there's it's a seventy, eighty thousand dollar salary plus benefits. So they're high, probably working on 15, 20 positions at a time. And they're cert, they're jumping around to this manager, that manager. And how, again, how much time are they really spending initially with those with those candidates? And also, they don't have the flexibility like I have. Like I can go, hey, I know that this person doesn't have every single checkbox, but I really like them. And this is why. It's harder for an internal recruiter to do that, you know? So then you have the contingent model. So yeah, you get outsourced it to contingent um, recruiting. And there are some very good contingent recruiting firms. I'm not going to say anything. I've worked in, with some incredible recruiters, but it is expensive. I mean, you're talking about a 20 to 25% placement fee, you know, for a $100,000 candidate. I mean, how many of those, if you have to place four or five of those a year, I mean, you're paying, spending a half a million dollars. <laughs> and what's the guarantee, right? Because the guarantee is six months to a year. And then they, there's a lot of risk, a lot of risk in the, in that. And I know, and, and when I talk to clients and I talk to candidates, they're just like, Oh, Oh, about the, they do not like the contingent model. Like you, they do not like it. And it's been the only model available. Right. So this model gives a third model. It's a different way of doing it. It's consultative. It's hourly. You can scale it. You're going to spend on average, probably about half of the placement fee. And you're going to get a lot more because you're going to get a dedicated person that's going to be working with you for 100, 120 hours, you know, of time. And you get a lot of more I, of candidates as well. I see, because I, I understand the contingent model and, and that's what I was familiar with. And so I was, I'll just be open. I was really surprised when I heard about how you run your business and your model, because I'm like, that is unlike any recruiting experience yeah. or knowledge I have in that industry. No one's doing that. And to come in from a consultant uh, a teammate, if you will, in the process. I mean, you're, you're offering a lot more than just a candidate, you know, potential candidate. You're also looking at the structure of it. You're looking at the integration. You're looking at, you know, the description and cold. I mean, so many different elements at an hourly rate. So there's so much benefit that, uh, I mean, no one's really doing this. Nobody's doing it. And, you know, I started doing it because one of my clients just during COVID, I was, I had taken a break from recruiting during my kind of my 
whole healing thing and, and <laughs> our endless healing thing. I don't think it ever ends, but you know what I mean? Um, yeah. And they asked me to come in and do, you know, some contract recruiting. And I was like, sure. I was like, I guess it kind of like an uncle thing. They're like, we really need some help. I was like, sure. I went in and I just loved it. It was just a di- totally, I mean, I've been contingent recruiting for almost 20 years. And, and I was so burned out of the hustle. I mean, it's very hustle based. It is like, I mean, it happens all the time. You have a, you find, you've worked in a position for four months. You, you find this candidate, they've taken the job and you're like, oh my gosh. And then they call you the day before and they're like, I'm not taking it. My company offered me $20,000 more. And you're like, oh no. Yeah, I know. I, mean, I can only happens. imagine. So it's very, very, very stressful. So it was, and so I thought I hated recruiting. I really did. I was like, I hate recruiting. I yeah. just hate it, right? <laughs> no, I just didn't like the, it didn't align to who I am because I align everything from this within. And for me, like, this is how I live my life. So this is how I want to live, run my company. It's funny you say that. I, I think of just, construction, which is our, our prehistoric dinosaur industry, right? We're slow to move. Um, you know, but there's been this age old thing that, you know, especially as a contractor, designer, architect that it's like, well, you design it and then you go get multiple bids and you see where you're at. And, you know, it's kind of the same thing. You just run that way for a long time. Whereas now, you know, our clients are seeing that, you know, you bring in the builder and designer and architect from the beginning. Well, now everyone comprehensively is figuring out budget. They're figuring out timelines. They're working together. They're trying to figure out the structure of the project. And now you're actually designing a project within budget or at least close to, I mean, there are so many variables as we know, but um, you know, you're putting a team together that now makes the project successful and you can actually enjoy your business as hard as it is. And I think uh, sounds very similar to you, Sim, in that you're just like, I, I actually enjoy my business because there's more value you're giving, but there's more value you're getting as well, just in the operation organ, you know, yeah. how you've organized it. I mean, I, I just, I love it. Like, I love it. I love the fact that, um, that I have this ability to shift how it's done. And I love that it's new and I love that it's all fresh. And I love to be, I, and I love the fact and it's just a weird thing, but you know, because it's so badly done. <laughs> so when you are like, I've had so many candidates be like, I have never worked with a recruiter like you before. Like, thank you. You know, or they say, th- you know, and then, you help them when they're in a very difficult situation. Cause that's the best feeling when they've been in toxic situations or they're struggling and you help them and they call you up and they're like, thank you. Like I had a candidate I recently placed. She was, I don't know what the position was, but she had a manager that would get angry her, the owner and throw paper at her, at her dad. I mean, <laughs> she's like, I can't stay here. Yeah. And I'm like, what? She's like, but I, I know I need to, I have a family, you know, I'm a single mom. I have, you know, I need to be able to provide. And so I'm like, okay, we got to get you out of there. And she reached out to me about three months ago and she's, I love my new job. I'm so happy. I'm like, you're so happy you're not having paper thrown in your head anymore. You know, <laughs> seriously. I mean, that's the impact or your clients say to you, oh my gosh, this person has done so many amazing things for our organization. They have brought not more than just the tangible sales, but they brought they, they have such a great attitude. They're such a team player, you know, it, that's really feels good. Yeah. That, that feedback, I can only imagine, you know, how that'd make you felt in a day that you're actually providing value and a service to someone that's, you know, much appreciated. Um, best advice you've been given. Hmm. In life in general, just anything. Yeah. Mm, my God. Business, What's personal that? life. Yeah. Let me just think for a second. I think for me personally, um, the best advice I've ever heard, and I and I and I hold to this, is that we are not always responsible for the things that happen to us in our life. Right? There are things that we experience in our lives that are very difficult, and we all will go through them, you know. But we are responsible for healing them, so we can break this world a better place. Because it's only through our pain that the world is where it is. So that's the advice that I hold on to in my heart. It, it's funny you just said that. I was just listening to a podcast yesterday. I was driving, um, and it was actually David Spade, the comedian. Mm-hmm. And he was on um, a, a, a podcast. And anyways, he was saying that, uh, 
he talked about, I think he was four, he was saying in the podcast or something that his dad left. So his dad wasn't really involved in his life and he has two brothers and he dealt with like this anger. Um, and, you know, t- to your point that he said, look, all of us, life's hard. And I think anyone listen to this, I can relate. You know, I've been through some really tough life experiences, especially before I started my company. And um, I think life's hard for all of us for different reasons. And we all have different life experiences, but um, the healing process is really important and understanding, you know, how to get through that and you know, not holding that anger. And he spoke about that. You're speaking about that. It's interesting, that self-healing. And you said that very first on in this episode. And now you can see your passion shine through the podcast right now, assuming that you can yeah, this like, revitalize energy because you've gone through that. And I think that's really sound advice. So, um, yeah, I appreciate you sharing that. Um, what do you have that's upcoming and exciting? Oh, let's see. What do I have coming up? Um, uh, no, 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 no. Well, I, um, I'm, I'm launching, I'm really excited about this lead generation, the, the webinar stuff that's going to be start launching in the next probably the next uh, month. I'm really, really, it's a next level for us. I'm really, really, really excited about that. I, I'm really excited to put more content out there, you know, with these eBooks and provide more quantity quality. Um, Cause I've been so in the business, like really. And now I'm starting to feel like, okay, I can, I can start this process a little bit, you know? So I'm excited about that. And honestly, I just, I love getting new clients. Like I love new, getting new positions and I love it. I just, I really, like, we really enjoy what we do. It's fun. Well, it shows. And I, I know you're super busy, so I can't thank you enough for making time today. So for those listening, you know that in any business, as you mentioned, medical, oil, gas, construction, design, architecture, whatever it may be, as they're looking um, to contact you, you know, how can they find you? So um, absolutely my website. There's a link that is a contact submission form on cherrytalentgroup.com. Um, you could also reach out to me on LinkedIn, Sue and Cherry. It's right there. Um, I'm offering like a 30 minute expert consultation call for free. If anyone wants to get some advice on their resumes or on the, if it's a candidate side or if it's a client side and they want to pick my brain on a position or s- some things are going on in the company. Absolutely. I'd love to chat with you guys. Well, that's amazing. Well, can't thank you enough for making time and I really appreciate it. This is really fun. Thank you so much. If you give value from the show, please support us by giving a five-star rating and review on whatever platform you listen to. And I also have a favorite ask. We've had some incredible guests that come on and share their wisdom, their knowledge about their business. So if you have friends or family members that could benefit from those episodes, please share it with them, as well as any other business owners that you're networking with that could get value from the podcast or certain episodes, please share those as well. Again, subscribe, make sure you're following any questions that you have, topics. We've had uh, listeners reach out about certain guests that we should have on the show. Again, brad.l at aftconstruction.com. Email me for topics to address, guests that we should have on, and even if you think you'd be a great guest for the show. So again, thank you for all your support, and we'll see you next time.